Hi everyone, um, thanks James for the opportunity to speak. Um, James was very good when I came back from the Middle East uh, for helping me reintegrate into uh, the Western world, so it was very, uh, uh, very grateful for that two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of context about what Buffalo Grid is, but I figured that I wouldn't bore you with 20 minutes about my company. I'll talk a little bit about it so you understand the context of the sort of pitch of what it is and what we do. It's quite dense because we do some quite weird stuff. Um, and we sort of realized today we're, we seem to be taking on every industry under the sun. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'll go into that in a bit of detail. Uh, and then I wanted to pull out a little bit, explain how I ended up there, and then explain, um, sort of try and weave together um, military theory and hardware startups. So let's see if that works. Um, so here we go. Never done this before. Never talked about this stuff before. I'm really excited because I've never actually talked about any of this stuff in public. So here it is. Um, so Buffalo Grid provides mobile power and internet to the off-grid world. There are 1.3 billion people around the world who live off-grid. That is a home or they live without access to stable grid power. Um, of those 1.3 billion people, our best estimates indicate that around 700, 750 million have a mobile phone. So if you think about that for a minute and you start to think about some context around that, you think, well, where are they getting their power from to charge that mobile phone? How can they live off grid and yet have a mobile phone? Where does the cell coverage come from? Um, so there's a bunch of kind of like interesting uh, things that we can burst here quite quickly. Um, the first one is most of the cell towers in the developing world um, or the bottom billion, uh, or the, bot the bottom of the pyramid as some people uh, like to call it, um, they exist off grid, so they're solar power and, and, uh, and uh, diesel generator uh, powered. Um, and what we do is we basically act like a petrol station. Um, so um, this is our hub, which I'll, you'll, you'll be seeing quite a bit of. of. Uh, the hub is solar powered, it's got a big deep cycle battery inside it, and it's completely cashless. Uh, you send a text message, premium rate text message to a particular number with a short code, uh, like you, I guess you would have done in the early noughties if you were buying a wallpaper or a ringtone. Um, that premium rate short code uh, is the way that you pay for power with us, and then we will dispense power through this, these kind of USB boards and these octopus cables here. We also, the, the hub is a, is a, is, is obviously has a, has a VPN, has a GPS connection in it, so we can verify its location. We have a secure connection to it, um, which means we can also offer a bunch of services off the back of that, such as logistics, because we can verify a point in a completely kind of obscure off-grid place. And um, we also sell internet uh, out the back of this. So we truncate 3G and in some cases 4G data onto a board of SIMs. Um, we pull that data down and then we distribute it and pump it out over a local Wi-Fi connection. So power, data, cell, um, MNOs, banking, because most of this is going through the banking inclusion company and we're working in mobile uh, payments, so it's, it's cashless. Um, who else are we going after? Logistics we're talking about at the moment. So it's kind of, it's funny, like most startups take on one industry, we seem to be taking on all of them. Um, so it's solar powered. I've got a little video here that I shot, hopefully it will play. Uh, this is one of our agents, um, basically charging phones. This is what these things look like. These are sold through banking inclusion agents across, the, um, across uh, Karnataka in Western India at the moment, which is where our trial's running. And, um, and yeah, this is a kind of busy night. The grid power uh, was on at this point, uh, but for this shop, not for the rest of the village. And yeah, he's basically just selling power for his phones. And you'll start to see some of our customers in a second. Um, we don't sell the hubs, you can't buy them. We're not a hardware company in that sense. We actually provide a service off the back of it. Um, there's a whole bunch of insights which kind of drove this. Um, but yeah, that's what it kind of looks like uh, in action. I think one of the things that surprises people about um, the part of the world we work in is that you can be in the middle of nowhere, literally in the middle of the jungle, and you can get a 3G data connection. Some of our early research in the sites that we've been testing indicates that between 40 and 50% of our customers have smartphones, low-end smartphones. Um, this is despite the fact that we're looking at an average income of less than $100, uh, sorry, less than 100 pounds per month. Um, it just shows the kind of premium they place on that piece of technology. So we sell through these agents. This is De Vapor. He's one of our agents um, in a place called Herenelor, which is on the western uh, uh, sort of rural bank of Karnataka. Um, he's a great guy. He's got six businesses or six income streams. Uh, he's a banking inclusion agent, which is a guess. Um, imagine an ATM if it was this big and you could carry it around. 
That's what banking inclusion is. It's a massive business in the developing world um, because the banking infrastructure, having a big shop doesn't really make sense. So you have these guys with these sort of portable devices. Um, you go and deal with that guy. You verify your biometric ID, scan your eye, whatever the kind of verification process is. He does that as well. That connection is verified that those two people existed and then they can transact like a bank and it all happens off the back of this terminal. We're piggybacking off what we call a human network. So the banking inclusion network is a human network and uh, we sell power through them as well. We're also trialing uh, solar lights and Wi-Fi at the moment. Um, can't go into too much detail about solar lights because it's very early, uh, but um, we've been pretty, we've been blown away by the uh, by the response. Um, we were expecting our trial, the pickup within our trial, to take between a month and two months, and we basically sold all our lights within three days. Um, so yeah, we're, we're not really. It was such a success. We don't really know what to do next. Um, so uh, so yeah, we're looking at lights as well. Uh, because, of course, uh, USB, a USB socket, uh, we can vary the power through it, and we can also do uh, electro electronic uh, verification of that device so we can lock devices to it and this kind of stuff. So it sort of gets, uh, yeah, it gets, gets a bit technical. Um, and this is what one of our shops looks like. Uh, it's literally uh, poking out in the middle of a jungle. Um, I could do a whole other talk on what doing a lean startup is like when your customers exist at the end of a dirt track in the developing world. And every time you want to test a product, you have to get on a plane, carry a big sucking great big piece of hardware with you, with a battery in which of course is illegal to fly with, travel to the other side of the world, um, jump in a car, sit in that car for 10 hours, get to the jungle, then get on a motorbike, then go off and then end up at this place here. And then you meet your customers. Um, and those customers uh, don't speak Hindi, a lot of them speak Kannada, which is a local dialect or local language, a local version of Hindi. Um, so yeah, there's some challenges. Um, it sometimes feels like, like I've said earlier, it take, we're taking on every single challenge under the sun. Um, I'm going to come back to this as well. Um, I'm going to also recap to make sure everyone's on the same page because I know this is, quite, um, this is quite dense. These are the kind of customers we typically serve. Uh, the majority of our customers are under 25. Um, a lot of them have the same motivations as we do. Uh, they just want to, I don't know, buy a nice phone, watch TV, hook up with somebody, maybe get a nice motorbike, wear some cool clothes, quite like this guy's, uh, guy's jumper. Um, uh, I went on a drunken mo motorbike ride uh, around the village with this guy last time I was over there two months ago. He was drunk, not me. Um, <laughs> sort of scared our Indian uh, operations manager because he's very anti-alcohol, but I was having a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, um, this is sort of young, poor, and connected. Um, you know, these guys, guys and girls do not make a lot of money, um, but they have access to Wikipedia. They're using Facebook. They're using WhatsApp. Um, they, they are using Google News, interestingly for us. Their primary news source is Google News, so they're kind of using aggregator as opposed to a particular news source, which is a kind of a relevant revelation for us. Um, and I guess just to give some context, the reason we're in India, um, we estimate uh, there are 290 million people uh, living in India who are off-grid, and a significant proportion of that, when you look at the mobile phone penetration uh, in India, um, uh, a significant proportion of that 290 million people uh, have mobile phones. So that's why we're in India. It's around sort of 30% of, of the global market for off-grid mobile power, which is an obscure market. Um, that's my iPhone. I gave it to this guy. He was about, I think he was about 9 or 10, and he was playing with it for 15 minutes. That's Crossy Road, best toilet game in the world, if anyone's kind of ever played it. And he hit 126 within about 15 minutes. He'd never played it before, never used an iPhone before. <laughs> So I think it just sort of goes to show, I mean, this guy, again, this guy's like 10. So regardless of education level, he's still basically figuring out maths and, 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 and really kind of basic stuff. And yet, he is absolutely clued up on how to use these kind of devices. Um, so these are our customers, and this is kind of briefly. Does that kind of make sense? Is everyone kind of on the same page as well? OK, good, right. So now we're going to kind of, um, now that the context is all set, I'm going to talk about some of the stuff we're using to build this company and how most of the thing, most of the kind of knowledge uh, we're using, we're pulling from a whole range of different fields and a lot of it personally that I'm using as the chief operations officer is military theory. Um, so here's a bit of background on how I ended up here. Um, so this is a, a quite a sexy map of the Middle East. These are um, undersea data cables in case anyone's wondering. Um, a POCS history of what I've, been, what I've done here. So I, I worked remotely for a company called Track24 uh, here from, uh, in London. Uh, our biggest client base uh, between 2008 and 2009 uh, was in Afghanistan, so I worked remotely over in London, but servicing clients in Afghanistan for two years. Um, Track24 is a battlefield management systems company. Um, does anyone play Command & Conquer? Yeah, that, but the real world. So that's what we sold. Um, and um, 
all our clients were over in Afghanistan, um, everybody from um, uh, diplomats and uh, intelligence agencies all the way through to um, uh, private security companies, uh, press organizations, uh, that kind of stuff, uh, charities, anybody uh, working in a weird part of the world, uh, we, were, we were servicing them with tracking devices and battlefield management systems and crisis and risk management systems. Um, I then uh, was working in Iraq for a little while um, uh, for a company called Arden, who are a private security and intelligence firm, um, which I will touch on. Um, also spent some time in, uh, time in Syria on holiday before it got um, tragically decimated. Um, before living in the Middle East, in, in the United Arab Emirates. Um, then working for uh, Isobar, which is a digital marketing agency. That jump did make sense to me, but it doesn't seem to make sense to anyone else. So working for um, Isobar, which is a digital marketing agency, servicing clients, telco clients, predominantly in Pakistan, which is that country there. And, and then, then following that, um, spending some time uh, a little bit lost in Iran. Um, before coming back to London and working with James. Um, and, um, and a, a small company called Berg. And that's kind of how I ended up here. So there's this kind of weird combination throughout the last 10 years that I've been, that I've had a career, I guess, where it's this combination of working in weird markets with really complicated technology. A lot of the stuff we were doing even at Arden was intelligence systems um, for, um, for essentially post-conflict zones and then building systems and operational processes to support a, uh, a, a standing security force. So, um, so I've kind of got this experience of doing tech in weird places, which is why Buffalo Grid made a lot of, lot of sense to me. Um, it kind of sums up, so the only picture that's not mine is that. Um, that's basically what my view of Afghanistan looked like. I'd kind of look at it through these kind of satellite maps and stuff, and scratch my head and wonder what on earth was going on. Um, and then Arden, uh, this picture I took of the burning oil fields in Basra, um, quite a weird sight if you get the chance to see it. Um, before, yeah, that was, a, that was a night out in Karachi, in the bottom left. We went to a gun shop, which was fun. Uh, on Sindh National Day, don't recommend it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then some time in Iran. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk about some of the stuff that we're using, or I'm using, to inform how we work. So this is an attempt to weave these things together. So apologies if it doesn't quite work. Um, I kind of rushed it through. If you talk to any military strategist, the only thing they will tell you that is important is logistics. Everyone gets excited about intelligence and special operations and the battle space and all this kind of stuff. But basically, as far back as you go, all the way back to Sun Tzu and von, Ka von Clausewitz, who I'll quote, and Anton de Jomini and, and all these kind of military strategists, they will basically all say pretty much this. Amateurs talk about tactics, but professionals study logistics. If you've got a thing or a group or a, or a project or whatever it is and it's in the middle of nowhere, especially if it's hardware based and you're dealing with physics, um, as in you can't just drop a, you know, you can't teleport an engineer there and solve a problem. You've got to pick a thing up and move it. Um, that logistics chain becomes um, absolutely crucial. Now, obviously, in the modern world, you've got companies like DHL doing some, some phenomenal stuff around that. And actually, Amazon are one of the sort of leaders in this. I um, don't know if anyone's seen some of that some of that weird kind of algorithmic stuff they're doing where they, they, they predict that you're going to buy something before you buy it, so they start moving the product towards you. <laughs> it's quite weird. Um, so they're kind of one of the market leaders in logistics, but pretty much nothing's really changed in the last couple of hundred years. You're moving a, you're moving a box. How do you move that box? And there's all these really interesting kind of things about barges and moving barges and stuff. Anyway, um, so this is, uh, this is kind of an image uh, from outside Herenelor cell tower. If anyone's, anyone's interested. Um, so yeah, there's no line of code that can transport an engineer here within an hour. And these are the kind of problems that we, that we end up dealing with. Um, you know, you're on a phone to a guy in the middle of nowhere. He's talking broken English to you. And you say, what's wrong with it? And he says, the lights aren't on. And you're like, great. <laughs> and then you start to kind of work back from that. And it's the systems and processes we've been using to do that. So interestingly, a lot of the things, and I'll, come, I'll touch on this a few times, Google surveys are amazing. <clears throat> for kind of truncating information. Um, and it's, I would probably say it's the single tool we use the most. Um, you can access them on a, on a really cheap uh, Android mobile phone and punch in information that we can then read remotely. Um, so it's something we keep using again and again. And this is another thing that we've kind of ended up spending a bit of time thinking about, which is this concept of clustering. The purple dots are where our first trial was. 
And as you can see, they're kind of spread out. To give you an idea, that to that is about a sort of six to seven hour drive. It's only about 150 kilometers, but the roads are terrible. So it's, it's quite a stretch. So servicing a bunch of locations, picking up these hubs, dropping these hubs off, um, training people, getting people together to a single point where you can train them um, is a real challenge. Um, so we kind of started clustering around this area. We have primary, secondary, and boundary zones now, which we kind of keep trying to push our trial sites into. Um, and then, of course, we're redeploying constantly. So we take the kind of priority hubs, the ones that are working really well, and we kind of have this sort of uh, very Darwinist kind of system where basically if you're in the bottom 10%, we pull the hubs and we move them on. Um, uh, and so I just wanted to kind of show this kind of challenge that we're facing. This is about 800 kilometers, this drive. We have one guy servicing this and supporting uh, and training this entire area. Um, so we've learned a lot, but the, the, the main thing we've learned is clustering um, and this, this idea that you start with one location and then you spread out and then you um, essentially, I guess it's sort of a hub and spoke model to a certain extent, but it's initially we would start with kind of four, well, one or four points in a surrounding area and then we sort of grow in alternate directions and we kind of let it sort of evolve out like that. Um, whereas previously what we were doing is looking for the best locations and just dropping them there. But the technical challenge of supporting them is something which kind of uh, made us row back on that. Um, yeah, intelligence, or as I like to call it, research, because that's essentially what it is. Um, so a great part of the information obtained in war is contradictory. A still greater part is false, and by far the greatest part is of doubtful character. We almost never actually know what's happening in these locations. We never really know what's happening around them. There's very little data on these places where we're operating. Um, if you find a town or a city of about 100 to 150,000 people, you can start to understand the demographics of that place. You can start to understand whether they've got grid power, they've got cellar access. And we do a lot of satellite um, uh, image analysis in order to do that. But, um, but yeah, the picture is f fuzzy and hazy. So a lot of what we're doing is basically bombarding questions in the simplest possible way, in sort of semi-broken English through these forms and, and, and analyzing the, the data that comes back, both in satellite imagery and then in the research. Um, so this is, uh, this is a, the superstar of Buffalo Grid, really. This is Jagan. He's our India operations manager. I won't tell you the joke I told him when he was laughing like that. Um, <laughs> um, but basically, if you, if you kind of talk to any intelligence operator these days, they will say, yeah, sure, GCHQ, loads of data, it's great, you can just swim through it and pluck out people's Facebook histories and all the rest of it. But <clears throat> in that kind of swamp of data, it's a real challenge to actually pull out, in some cases, to pull out meaningful intent. And so the art of human intelligence is becoming more and more critical, and it will never really die. So it's our lifeblood. And what this essentially looks like is talking to people face to face, asking people their opinion on things, and then trying to, getting that in bulk and then trying to sort of gather that into meaningful conclusions that you can then act on. Um, such as, how much power is there in your village today? How much power was there in your village a week ago? Because of course this really affects us because we're an off-grid uh, power supply. A lot of these villages do have grid power, so there's a cable going to them, but there just isn't the capacity within the grid to actually provide power down those pipes. Um, so yeah, I mean, and we also have this, which is, uh, we've got military grade geospatial intelligence, which is free from Google, uh, which is fantastic, frankly, and no wonder um, it's been such a disruptive force. I mean, I know we all use it sort of here in, in the UK on a, on a regular basis, but I mean, these are, these are images of completely obscure off the, off the map villages in, uh, in, in Karnataka in India. And we can gather quite a lot of intel just by looking at these uh, individual images. So just very quickly, this is Kenshinala. This is one of our most successful villages. Um, you can do a rough count of the number of houses. And then you can sort of, we have an average understanding of how many adults will be in the house. And we have an understanding of how many adults typically have mobile phones. So then we can estimate how many mobile phones are on the village. So then we've got a rough understanding of what our market looks like in that location. Then we've also got a train line running through, which means it's a primary, it's a primary transit hub. And you've got a, quite a decent road running out as well, which means people are standing around at stations with time to kill and no power. And what are they doing? They're on their mobile phones. So we have a captive market there as well. You can also um, spend a bit of time looking for power lines and tracing those power lines in so you can confirm whether there's grid power there. 
Um, and all this is relatively objective as well, which is kind of really useful for us. Um, these are typically the kind of places that we spend most of our time um, because they're between sort of 1,000 and about 2,000 population. The village is a bit bigger than this. You just can't quite see it on the shot. Um, with, a cat, with a sort of regional sort of catchment area around that village of about 5,000. And increasingly, we're also looking at places like this. So just up here is uh, Shimuga, uh, it's the, the sort of small city of Shimuga. And this is a kind of primary, I think this is the NH206, which is a primary arterial road running straight through, which means that people are stopping along the way for petrol and their phone's running out and they want to listen to music in their car because who doesn't? And um, that's kind of uh, essentially where we can provide service, whether it's uh, Wi-Fi or, or power. But just like any other company, uh, you know, data is uh, vitally important to us. Pulling data out of uh, these places is really hard. Um, and I'm a big believer in, you know, you can only manage what you can measure. Um, so... Um, one of the things we can measure just from a phone number is we can pull from that phone number the telco that the, uh, um, the customer is on. And we do that by basically we kind of calculated this, like the socioeconomic groups which are most likely to port their number from one network to the other. Basically, the poorer you are, the less likely you are to buy a SIM card on one network and then take your number to another. Um, so we kind of started um, kind of getting a map of the kind of telcos in India and what share of our um, of our of our customer base, had those, uh, we're on those telcos, uh, and then now we're talking to telcos and we're using this data to basically get them to subsidize power for their customers as a value-added service, which is a key tenant of our business model. Um, and then on, over on the left here, um, red is mobile charges, which is tracking up. We had a bit of a strange situation go on between September, September and October, but the most important metric for us is the yellow. That's unique customer growth. So this is a fixed number of hubs. So we haven't increased the number of sites during this period. This is just optimizing those sites and making those sites more efficient, selling more power, selling more internet from those sites. Um, and we did that through backbreaking process work, training, simplifying things, providing quick start guides. Um, we have an SMS service which basically um, informs our agents how many charges they sold yesterday, how many they need to sell the next, sell the next day in order to hit their targets. Um, and yeah, Grand doesn't come for free. We have these um, charge trackers, which are um, a very binary system where every time a, uh, an agent charges a phone, they, they strike a, a line within the book, uh, and that allows them to sort of manually calculate, calculate with a pen and piece of paper where they are towards their incentives for that month, um, as well as the SMS system. <laughs> this is a quote uh, from uh, Tim Malley. It's a really interesting article if anyone wants to grab it. Um, it's called, I actually haven't put the whole thing on here, but it's called What We Talk About When We Talk About When We Talk About Making Things. And it's a sort of assessment of what hardware and massive networks of sublime scale look like, which is essentially what we're about to get into. And he says, we're beset by wicked problems exacerbated by networks of sublime scale that have been built on top of millennia of injustice, chaotically interacting with good works and hope. Basically what he's saying is when you're dealing with these really complicated systems, you have no idea what's going on. All you can do is kind of sort of nudge things within a certain direction, cross your fingers, hope it will work, and then measure the output and see if it has. Um, and that's a lot of what we're doing. And the best way to do that conveniently, as James uh, started with, is um, we have these deep specialists with, and broad generalists. Um, so I won't go into detail about what everyone does, but this is pretty much the extent of Buffalo Grid. We've got a bunch of advisors, and we have an Indian operations manager getting people in one place for photographs very hard. Um, but we have uh, product designers, electrical engineers. Um, within the team, we've got people with uh, experience building um, electronic systems for Formula One cars, um, as well as myself and what I do. Uh, Daniel's experience in, in massive kind of uh, energy uh, projects and, um, and what have you. So uh, we're based at the RCA. And um, it's been an amazing um, opportunity for me to confirm what I was taught years ago when working with um, some ex-Special Forces guys, which is that if you've got a small group of good people, you can achieve anything. And I think that really does apply to startups, and it's a lesson which really kind of seems to overlap between the two. Um, I don't support this quote, but I do think it's quite interesting. This is a quote um, that... Um, Carl Rove uh, was attributed to Carl Rove, although he never actually uh, claimed it. And he basically was saying, uh, yeah, when we act, we create our own reality. And he was referring to the journalists and saying, you will study that reality judiciously as you will, and we'll act again, creating other, uh, other new realities. And I think what it's always, um, without getting into the idea of simulcrums and representations of the self within the internet and, and this kind of idea, I think it's really interesting because it shows that when you're doing something really weird, there is no template you're doing things for the first time every day and you're learning 
on a daily basis about the strange new stuff you're doing, and you are in many ways creating a new reality. I have to admit, it certainly feels like that when we're in places like this. Uh, this is a place called Signcheck in Bihar, which is a very sort of painful and powerful experience for me, spending time in this village. Um, this is about as nice as the village gets. Uh, you've got people on living on less than a dollar a day. Um, education level uh, is, in gen is, generally speaking, um, sort of sub eight or sub five years old. Um, no literacy. When you're educating people about a piece of technology and they don't have a basic level of literacy in ever, any language, you start to understand the impact that has on, um, well, on, their, on their developmental capability. And it's been a really, really kind of amazing exercise in design for us to essentially create technology for people with that, with that level of understanding. Now, by all means, not all our sites are like this. Actually, a lot of our agents tend to have um, 18 to 21 um, education level, but some of them don't. So building a system which is that simple to use, doesn't use language, uses things like emoticons and smiley faces and lights, has been, uh, has been really interesting, very powerful. And actually, this experience was personally for me um, yeah, quite affecting. I can only describe parts of Bihar as a Hobbesian state. It is a, can be a punishing place for people. And um, it's really powerful when you go over there and you spend time over there and you're delivering this service to know that what you're doing is actually genuinely changing people's lives. And how? Because it's just power. Well, you're actually allowing people to use their phones. We kind of take it for granted, but when you think about the difference between being able to make a phone call and not make a phone call, and the impact that has in a place where there is no police, um, you start to think about how that can really change the fabric of a small society, um, which is why we think mobile power and increasingly mobile internet is going to be, is going to be very powerful. Um, so just to kind of pull out uh, before I close, um, this is something I, I sort of bang home whenever I get the opportunity. Um, most of the world does not look like San Francisco. Most of the world looks like a combination of these different places, whether it's Kowloon World City, um, which has now been demolished um, in this strange... Does anyone know about Kowloon World City? It's an amazing place, um, which I'll try and squeeze in. But um, Elysium, terrible film. The concept behind it and the actual world building is incredibly compelling. And if you were to ask me what the next 50 years are going to look like, it's probably much more closer to uh, somewhere like Elysium than something like Gattaca. Um, and then you've got places like the Tower of David in Caracas, I believe it's Caracas, um, which is this huge kind of um, sort of 50-story tower block which uh, never really got the funding to actually um, open and then was subsequently taken over by um, people um, who were, uh, who'd been basically didn't have a home and it's been kind of reclaimed by the city. Um, these are the places for us where the real technological challenges of the 21st century exist. Um, and that's where, that's where we're focusing. And of course, Mumbai and India. My favorite stat, and I, I do hope I get this right about India, is that you under, if you imagine a, a, a city from Heathrow to around the Olympic Park, and you draw a kind of sort of circle, which encompasses one on the right and one on the left. Can you imagine in London, we probably have about 10 million people in that area. From what I know, there are nearly 100 million people living in the same space in Mumbai. So imagine in the context of London, you think it's crowded now? Imagine 10 people for every one living in London. Think about the technological challenges that happen on a daily basis. Think about the design challenges and think about the products and services these people need. They're not going to be the same kind of products and services we need. And increasingly, um, most of the people who are living in these parts of the world are becoming powerful um, money spending consumers. So our attitude is, in some ways, charities aren't going to solve the problem. Build a company that can do it instead. Um, before I close, I just want to talk about Kowloon. <laughs> just want to talk about Kowloon World City. Do spend some time and check this place out. It is um, obsessed over by sci-fi geeks and um, urbanists, town planners, technologists. It's appeared in so many films. It no longer exists anymore, but. It was the most densely populated square kilometer in the world when it was knocked down. And it is essentially a petri dish for what many people think um, the majority of the world's population are going to be in. It's, it's a petri dish for a sort of place and the majority of the world's population are going to be living in in, in the next couple of hundred years. So um, you get, if you take anything away, take a look at that place. Thanks very much.